Good morning, and thank you for joining us for today's Healthcare Forum. I'm Katie Hinkey, Vice President of Government Affairs for the Tulsa Regional Chamber. Today's discussion is about what so many conversations have been about this year, the COVID-19 pandemic. Our speakers today will provide the latest information about vaccinations, mitigating exposure risk, public health strategies, and more. After their presentations, we'll take questions from our audience, so please use the Zoom's chat feature to ask your questions. Before we introduce our panelists, I'd like to thank the sponsors of the Chamber's Healthcare Forum series. Our presenting sponsors are Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Oklahoma, Osteopathic Founders Foundation, St. Francis Health System, and Tulsa Bone and Joint Associates. Our gold sponsors are Cancer Treatment Centers of America in Tulsa, Connor and Winters, Crossland Construction Company, Flying Colors, Hillcrest Healthcare System, OSU Center for Health Sciences, and OU Physicians. We're joined today by Dr. Jeff Gallus, Chief Medical Officer for Hillcrest's Utica Park Clinic, and Doug Williams, Senior Vice President for St. Francis Health System and Hospital Administrator for St. Francis Hospital. Dr. Gallus has served as Chief Medical Officer of Utica Park Clinic since 2004. He graduated from the Oklahoma State University College of Osteopathic Medicine in 1988 and he completed his internship at Tulsa Regional Medical Center, which is now Oklahoma State University Medical Center, in 1989. In 1992, he completed his residency at the University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics. He is board certified in internal medicine and has practiced with Utica Park Clinic since 1992. Dr. Gallus is actively involved in quality improvement and he serves on multiple Hillcrest Medical Center com committees. Doug Williams has been with St. Francis Health System for 20 years. He is a member of the system's leadership team as senior vice president and administrator for St. Francis Hospital and was previously vice president for St. Francis Heart Hospital. He is a graduate of Saginaw Valley State University and has a master's in healthcare administration from Oklahoma State University. We've got two pokes. Thank you all for joining us today to discuss your perspective on COVID-19. Dr. Gallus, let's please start with you. Well, well, thank you. And I wanna thank the Tulsa Regional Chamber of Commerce for the invitation. This is a, a wonderful subject to talk about and, and something that you know we're steeped in right now. And, uh, and I think um, I've got a little time and I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about where we've been, where we are, and, 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 and a little more time on where we're headed with this, with this pandemic. Um, and, and I think, um, you know, uh, hopefully we'll touch on things that are matter that matter to, to our business community and to, to our fellow uh, 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 people in our community. Um, going back to when March, April, when we first kind of started realizing, you know, the impact of the pandemic, I think, you know, we were all learning our way. Um, and, and, you know, we, there was a lot of information that was that was presented to us. That, that you know we were speculating on you know we, we wondered about what this virus would do during the summer months you know the typical coronaviruses that we see that cause colds in our community wane during the summertime and and so we don't see those and so so we thought maybe this uh, uh, SARS uh, uh, CoV-2 would do the same thing I think we've learned over that period of time that it did not and as a matter of fact it you know it, it just continued to to uh, to spread across our communities you know, we, we, we learned a lot about how to manage these people in the hospital. Um, you know, uh, we, we learned about how to protect our most vulnerable patients, um, you know, our nursing home residents or our, our, our skilled nursing uh, residents. Um, so over the, over the last six months, we've done a lot to help mitigate to some degree, um, you know, the impacts of this. But, but when we look at what's happened um, in terms of number of cases, in terms of the number of deaths that have happened, 
this virus has, has really, I think, surprised a lot of people. Um, I think the fact that, um, that we're, we're continuing to see, despite masking, despite you know, encouragement to social distance for hand washing, we continue to see the spread of this virus across our communities. And I think that's been one of the biggest challenges is that you know, how do we mitigate something that we don't have an effective treatment for? And, and, and I, again, you know, our public health officials have helped guide us. We've, we've, we've seen a lot of different um, presentations around what do we do with schools and how do we, how do we protect um, um, teachers with, w w while we allow our businesses to stay open and, and parents to stay at home uh, or, or to be able to go to work and not have to be stuck at home um, you know, monitoring children. And, and th those kind of issues have been challenges for all of us. I think whether you're in the healthcare community in the business community or otherwise, um, you know, these have been learning experiences that no one thought that we would be going through at this point in time in our lives. Um, that being said, you know, right now, you know, what are we looking at? You know, uh, we're looking at a challenge that every hospital system across the United States is struggling with. When, when, we, when we thought about, you know, this virus in the spring and in the summertime, we thought, well, maybe, as I mentioned, um, things will settle down. But what we've seen is a consistent pattern. And that consistent pattern is that with holidays, we've seen spikes and, and surges, you know, of, of infection in our communities. You know, we saw it after after Memorial Day, after the Fourth of July. We saw the same thing after after Labor Day, and and now we're really in the midst of another surge um, after Thanksgiving holidays. And I think you know the big challenge for a lot of us is that our normal work schedules and our normal daily patterns. You know, we're pretty good about um, masking, about washing our hands, about about social distancing. But it's those holidays when we when we want to be with our families and we want to be with our friends that are really the biggest challenges for, for us to prevent uh, uh, the spread of this of this illness. And, and, and I think that being said, you know, right now what we're seeing in our in our hospitals is kind of the the, the end result of, of our inability to help manage this and and to some degree. We can be critical of how how much we are social distancing and how we're following our our our, our health department's recommendations. But to some degree, it, it's the nature of this virus. You know, we know this virus is very very contagious, and and even those of us who in, in the healthcare community who have been absolutely as dedicated as we can be about all of these precautions, still some of us are are are, are getting infected. Um, and and again. We don't see those infections happening in the hospital setting for the most part. Where we see those infections happening is, is in the community with family events and th those type of things. And so, so those are the struggles that we're all dealing with. Now, when we step back and look at what's happening in our hospitals, you know, we've, we've learned a lot about managing um, uh, COVID uh, and, and COVID illnesses. One of the first things we learned was how do we, how do we protect the most vulnerable? Because if you think about what happened in March and April, the deaths were really happening in nursing homes, and you know, especially when we look at what happened in New York, that's where that's where the bulk of the deaths were happening. So we've done a lot to help mitigate that, but we continue to see hospitalizations. And what we've seen is is that we've seen a much younger population being hospitalized. So the death rate overall has has uh, as a percentage of those being hospitalized has gone down, but but the number of people being hospitalized has gone up because the rate of infection has gone up. And so, so, so there's, there's a little bit of a balance issue there that we're seeing. Um, what we're seeing in our hospitals now is really the level of acuity of hospital patients is much higher. It's not uncommon for our ICUs to be full outside of pandemic times, pre-COVID. But when we talk to our critical care specialists, the level of acuity of those people in the hospitals, especially in our ICUs, is much higher. Length of stays typically in the ICU might be two to three days. Now we're seeing length of stays eight, nine, 10 days for our typical COVID patients. And, and then the amount of work that's required to manage them is substantially higher because of all of the, all of the PPE that's required, all the assistance, the turning of the patients. We, we really can't stretch our staff the way we would in, in a typical non-COVID um, you know, situation because those staff are so busy with all of the work that's associated with managing you know, those really high acuity COVID patients. What we're seeing is that we have the capability, we have, we have ventilators, we have beds in the hospital. What we're struggling with is staffing. Um, and, and our staffing is really a challenge for several reasons. One is because of the acuity, but the other issue is that at any given date, out of our 5,000 employees across eight hospitals, we may have 
5% of our employees out because either they're infected, they've had an exposure at home, they've had an exposure at work, um, and, and we're waiting for test results to come back. And, and when you have a workforce that, that is constantly being um, monitored and tracked um, like this um, and, and, and being sent home, it's a real challenge because when one person's gone, everyone else has to fill that void. And I think in the business community, you are probably seeing the same thing. Um, we have an entire, you know, entire teams across our healthcare system now dedicated to, to, to tracking and trending and monitoring our, our employees because we don't want employees that potentially are infected in the hospital working. Um, but, but what that leads to is us excluding a lot of, um, of the critical staff that are there to take care of, uh, of, of our patients. And I think th those challenges alone um, are, are really daunting for anyone, and especially in the healthcare market. If I have one of my peers who's out for a week um, because they've had an exposure, someone has to do that work. And, um, and, and I think that type of situation has really put a lot of stress, emotional strain on our employees uh, and our staff. And, and I think, you know, despite the fact that, you know, many of our staff are dedicated and, and they view their work as a calling, um, you know, we usually have that ability to take a break, to take some time off. Right now, we really put a lot of pressure on our staff to be available as much as possible. And, and not having those breaks is a real challenge, um, you know, to, it, it just, just from, from a morale standpoint um, to, to working with these patients. But, but the other side of that is what we hear from our staff every day is, is, is how, much, how much gratitude they have to be able to help families and to work through these processes and, and to be there when they're needed. And I think, you know, we, we, we get such wonderful feedback from our staff about, about um, you know how, how gratifying it is to help take care of these patients, and so so I think that's the one thing that kind of helps offset some of those morale challenges that we have. So that being said, I think talking about where we're headed is really kind of where I want to spend some time because this concept about what we're dealing with in the hospital is such a challenge. You know, we we know that across the United States, you know, there are healthcare systems that are really at breaking points. We, we don't see that so much in Tulsa, but, but I think, you know, we hear the story, um, you know, in California and some of these other markets where, where hospital systems are really potentially compromising the quality of care because of the, 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 the workload that they have. So how do, we, how do we prevent this scenario that we're seeing right now from being protracted? I, I think number one, we look at what do we do for, for our Christmas holiday and our Christmas vacations? And I think, you know, we, we know that you know, college kids are starting to come home, um, uh, their semesters are ending, um, and, and they're potentially gonna bring infection back into our families. So, so how do we mitigate that? And what do we do with regard to um, uh, family events, um, you know, Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, New Year's events? Um, and, and we spend a lot of time with our own employees talking about maybe this is the year that we think about, you know, spending time with our, our pods of family that we know are close, that, that we, we know what they're doing and what their activities are like. And, and so, so maybe we don't have the whole family over for dinner this year. Maybe this year we just keep groups of people that are very close together, small numbers, small groups uh, for, our, for our meetings, doing more Zoom and, 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 and FaceTime with our family members. Um, you know, one of the other options is thinking about getting tested before you're with families. And, and you know, we know have, we have organizations that have rapid tests and, and there's value to some of those tests. It doesn't last very long. And, and, and so if you go to get a rapid test before you're with a family event, you've got about a day or two where you can feel comfortable that, that, that you're probably not shedding virus in an asymptomatic way. Other tests, the PCR tests, which take a day or two to come back, we know that we probably have three to five days of pretty, pretty um, assured uh, that, that they're not um, shedding virus at that point in time. And so, so I would say, if you're thinking about being with family members, especially family members who are at risk, are you know, people 65 and older, people have chronic conditions, think a little bit about possibly getting tested a couple of days before uh, the event um, to make sure that you know, you're not asymptomatic and potentially spreading to someone at risk. Um, and, and again, you know, um, as I've said before, um, you know, limiting the exposure to, to, to only the people who you're the most comfortable with. I have family members who have said, before you come home from college, um, you will be tested before we see you. And I think, you know, those are the kind of things that, that we have that are hard conversations to have, but I think provide some value. 
the, the, the good news, and, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, but uh, um, the, we are really excited about vaccination. Um, the concept of herd immunity is really important because ultimately where we all want to be is, is where 60 to 70 percent of all of us are protected. Either we've had exposures or, we're been, or we've been vaccinated. And, and I think this concept of herd immunity is really important. And maybe we can talk a little bit more about that in, in our, our Q&A session. But, but, but the process of getting everyone vaccinated is going to be very important. And that's a very complex process. Our health department leaders are doing a, a fantastic job of getting the ball rolling and getting guidance to us about who needs to get these vaccines first and how we phase this process in. Um, and, and now what we really need to see is vaccine coming in where we can get distribution centers up and running, where the healthcare systems begin vaccinating their, their staff and their patients, and where we can get the, you know, the public health um, tools in place to get 20 to 30,000 people a week vaccinated. Because that's what it's going to take to get us to the point where um, in, in, in December and uh, uh, January of next year, we can feel more comfortable, we can be around each other um, and, and be safe. And so, so I think, you know, we can talk a little bit more about that, but I think that's really the end game for, for all of us. And, um, and, and I'll kind of close it at that um, and, uh, and, uh, and let Katie kind of uh, go with the rest of the conversation. Thank you so much, Dr. Gallus. Mr. Williams, we are now going to turn it over to you. Hi, thank you, Dr. Gallus. That was some excellent advice and information. Um, I'll steer my opening comments more broadly based on the hospital system and kind of what our experience has been. Um, as I said, or as it was given in my overview, I've been with St. Francis for 20 years and I started out as a registered nurse. And so it was very important for me during this pandemic to make sure that from the frontline perspective that we were meeting all the needs of our staff members. And it's been what I would call a range of emotion. This has been the most unique thing that I've been part of, um, whether it was the first patient testing positive March 1st to the elation when we were able to do drive through testing. And, and I bring that up because I think that this um, condition has brought innovation and a spirit in the healthcare society that I have not um, witnessed during my, my 25 years in healthcare. Um, you know, when you walk on the front line and you're walking through the cohort units, we start off with one cohort unit and then now we're up to four. We re in the beginning of the pandemic when we were dealing with the uncertainty and the unknown, um, we were running an average daily census in the 30s, and now we run a census in two, over 200. This morning we had a census of 210. And so what that does is it paints a picture of just the grind that this has taken. Um, it's been an emotional roller coaster for the staff, as Dr. Gallus has pointed out. Um, staff have been exposed continually, um, whether they're on the cohort unit or on their, they're in the emergency room treating patients that um, you're not sure, you assume everybody that's coming through is positive and you're, you need to protect yourself. And in the beginning, we were short of uh, personal protective equipment and you saw society ramp up and really, um, you know, change manufacturing, change the way that PPE is delivered, change the distribution routes and able to provide supplies to the frontline staff. The other thing that I saw in Tulsa, which made me very proud, was this pandemic has really brought the healthcare systems and the Tulsa Health Department very close together. Um, it's, we talked to Dr. Dart daily as we're dealing with new situations, as we came up with policies on how to quarantine and what we needed to do from a testing perspective. Um, and we communicate with the healthcare systems as we become full. If you look across not only Tulsa, but Oklahoma, the hospitals are full. They're, they have little to no ICU capacity, little to no med surge capacity. And you see Oklahomans being transferred from Oklahoma to surrounding states that have capacity as we're in this um, surge. And if I can, I'm gonna try to share my screen, which this graph goes along with what Dr. Gauss was saying. Let's see, did it come across? No. It didn't? Sorry. Yeah, we can see it, it looks great. Oh, you can see it, yeah, so if you, if you if you look at the trend line with the dates along the bottom, you can see March 1st where we had our first patients in Oklahoma, and then we had our first surge, 
And then um, as people, as cities shut down and all the different things that happened, you can see that the trend line went down. Then in the summer, we began to lax a little bit and our trend line goes up. And then you can really see after the 4th of July holiday, um, we had a huge spike, as Dr. Gallus pointed out, as people start to um, relax as they get together with their families. And, you know, internally we call those the secret spreaders. You know, you trust your family, you want to be around your family, and that's where you're most likely to let your guard down. And as you go through this, holidays starting all the way to um, Labor Day in September, you can see that we have just dramatically trend up. And a lot of that, I think, has to do with society's apathy towards people are tired. Healthcare workers are tired um, because of the fear and the grind. And then society's tired of wearing a mask and feeling restricted. And as people went back to school, and it's, it, you can see that as we've had a lot of holidays in the fall, you can see that our, we've trended up dramatically. I would like to point out that while our trends of COVID positive patients are continuing to rise, and we hope to mitigate a lot of that with our vaccines, our masking from a respiratory perspective and all the hand washing and all the things that we have, have um, instituted across Tulsa and across the United States has really paid off. You know, at this time of the year with our children's hospital, we normally are starting to fill up with flu and RSV cases. And to date, we've had very, with no inpatients in our children's hospital related to flu or RSV. And we've had just less than 1% of the positive cases that we would have had in the previous years. So, and let's see try to stop sharing this. Sorry, I'm not the most technologically advanced. There we go. Okay, back. So um, I, I say all that to say that it's been just a lot of peaks and valleys from an emotional standpoint on the front line with our nurses, our physicians, our respiratory therapists. Our phlebotomists are taking the samples. Um, right now we're testing about a thousand patients a day through our health system. And right now we're running a positivity rate of about 24%. And that kind of coincides. If you lay that month over month, we started off running about 8% back in the spring, 10% over the summer, and then each month this fall, our positivity rate has continued to grow. With last, uh, with um, November running uh, 20, and then December month today, we're running about 24%. Um, and so, while a lot of stress and anxiety has occurred with this, I yesterday I was up walking through our. Uh, area where we're giving the vaccine as it's being rolled out and the amount of energy that came across from the physicians and the staff that were going through that and that we have a, a drive-through location across the street that street that we're using for flu vaccines and when I went over to the huts just to kind of to watch people and talk to people as they were going through the huts it, it just it, it gives a lot of hope and you know the time of the year with it being the Christmas holiday I think that hope will hopefully carry us through as we get to the finish um, as the vaccine, as Dr. Gallus pointed out, as we try to get to herd immunity. And that's just kind of a brief overview. I'll, I'll table that for the rest of my comments for our question and answer format. Thank you so much, Mr. Williams. So now we'll take start taking questions from the attendees. So um, please, if you have a question, submit those using the Zoom's chat feature, and I'll direct them to our panelists. But I have a few questions to get us started. So we've touched on the vaccinations and um, I was just wondering, could you all explain to us exactly how they work? Uh, so so let, let me kind of kick that off and, 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 and uh, Doug, you can sure chime in. Um, the, the, these, this is a really fascinating uh, discussion around uh, these new vaccines. So, so the two vaccines we're talking about really are the, the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine. And, and these are two vaccines that, that are referred to as messenger RNA vaccines, which are unique. Um, they're the first of their, of their class. Um, and, and what they basically do is, is they create a message um, uh, through an RNA uh, uh, sequence that, they, that we inject that, that goes into the cell and, and basically allows the cell to reproduce a component of this COVID vaccine um, that looks very much like what we call the spike protein. And, and you hear people talk a lot about the spike protein, but that's where the antibodies respond and how they, how they keep um, the, the, these, uh, these virus particles from, from being uh, 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 dam damaging. 
And so what happens is these messenger RNA uh, components go into the cell and the cells then produce these kind of fake spike proteins, which then triggers our immune system. And once our immune system see these, sees these fake spike proteins, they respond and then create, create the, you know, the, the uh, uh, antibodies that are then stay circulating in our system and are prepared for when we actually are exposed to the real virus. You know, the, the problem we have with people who have never had exposure to this, in, this infection, which is almost all of us, is that we don't have any underlying immunity. So, so when we get exposed to the, to, the, to the virus, it takes our immune system a week to a week and a half to really begin to, 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 ex, to, to express these antibodies to help protect us. Well, in the meantime, the virus has done the damage. And so, so there, there in, in lies the, 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 the battle we, we've lost already. But with these vaccines, we are really prepared now. So if we get exposed to the virus, um, you know, we, we are ready uh, and ready to go. Now, the fact that, you know, that these vaccines are RNA vaccines really has kind of um, started a whole lot of conversations about long-term issues. What happens when we're injecting messenger, M M messenger RNA into us? Well, these, these segments of, of, of uh, uh, RNA are, lasting, are, are short lasting. They only last in the, in the body for a few days and then they're gone. And our body makes thousands of messenger RNA uh, 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 proteins every, every second. And, and these come and go and they tell our cells what to do um, and what, what things to make. Um, and so this is a normal process. Um, what's unique about it is that these are the first of the vaccines we've ever had that use this message. And, and I think what we're gonna see is that this is gonna be maybe the gold standard for vaccines moving forward. We'll certainly see more um, uh, messenger RNA vaccines uh, moving forward uh, as, as we look at development of vaccines for other illnesses. Mr. Williams, do you have anything to add to that? The only thing I would like to add, um, as I've been talking with people, as Dr. Gall has pointed out, that this is a brand new technology uh, from a vaccine perspective. The science behind the development has been around a long time. And, and I think as people start to understand that, it eases the concern and fear that they have and the preconceived notion about it being a, a test type of a, of a thing. And so that should give people a lot of confidence um, that this will be very successful. So I have a question from Amy Pulliam. She said, how surprised are Dr. Gallus and Mr. Williams that a vaccine is already available? We know sometimes it can take years to create a vaccine and this was only created in about nine months. So is there, just like Mr. Williams, he said, I know a lot of people are a little apprehensive about how it was created so quickly um, and whether or not it's safe, but what, what is your opinion on um, that quick turnaround? Yeah, I would, I'll start this one. Um, a lot of times the, the amount of time it takes to get something through all of the FDA and the CDC clearinghouses and all the different nations is what causes the delay, not necessarily the development. Um, and with the science behind this, have been, it's been around for a while. Um, so while I was surprised that it was ready to go in December of the year of the pandemic, that just shows you what the world is able to accomplish as it comes together using technology that exists. And once you are able to clear some of the hurdles uh, to get something to market. And, and, I, and I'll, I'll add to that. I, I think one of the questions we forget to ask is why is it traditionally taken so long for a, for a vaccine to be approved? Um, and, and I think what people don't understand is that there are so many factors that go into development of a new drug or a vaccine. And, and some of it is, you know, business related, what's the demand going to be? How much can we charge for this? How much is it going to cost for us to do this? I mean, you know, these trials are phenomenally expensive. Um, and, and, then, and then the FDA process to, to get cleared. And this is why it typically takes years and years and years. You know, what the federal government basically did was said, we're going to take the business component out of this. We're going to take the legal component out of this. We're going to give you protections. And now we want the scientists to do what the scientists do, which is which is create new tools. Um, you know, the fact of the matter is that the testing component really isn't any different than any other vaccine we've ever approved. When you look at you know vaccines for RSV, for example, we, they did about the same number of of patients in those tests before those vaccines were released. 
Well, you know, no one was concerned about that because it took so long, but the actual testing was no different than what, what it was for, for these vaccines. So, you know, we've got 60,000 people in each of these different trials. We've got a really, really good um, pool of data to say that these, these vaccines are safe. And the other thing that's important for people to understand is that when we look at the safety of a vaccine, we're going to see typically the bad things happen within the first two weeks and at longest within the first two months after a vaccine has been tested. We don't necessarily have to have a vaccine in trials for, you know, years to determine whether or not it's safe or not. Um, you know, two to two months is more than enough time. We've got lots of data on people now who have had their second dose of these vaccines for well over two months. And the data is all still um, turning out to be very, very promising in the sense that we can we can very confidently say that these two vaccines are safe. So speaking of that data, what do we know about those that have had the vaccination? Are they still able to spread the virus? How long does it take before they're immune, essentially? So let, let me kind of just kick that off a little bit. Um, so, so I think there's two things that we need to think about with these vaccines. Number one is, you know, how well does the vaccine prevent the development of illness? And number one, number two, how well does the vaccine prevent infection? Because as we know with this virus, people can be infected and not be ill. And, and, and this is the challenge, and this is the unique nature of this virus, is that we've got people walking around spreading the virus and have no knowledge that they're doing that. So I'll, I'll take the first, you know, th these vaccines have both demonstrated around 95% effectiveness in preventing illness. So people who get it, 95% of those people do not get clinical symptoms. But, but the most important thing for people to understand is that, that um, those vaccines still, people still get um, infected when they've been vaccinated. So they're between 65 and 70% effective at preventing infection. So, so why I say all this is that this whole concept that as soon as I've had my vaccine, I can stop wearing a mask is not true. Um, until we have herd immunity, until our most vulnerable populations um, have been vaccinated, um, we still need to wear a mask. And I can tell you, I anticipate wearing a mask in my, in my uh, office and when I'm out in social activities for another year at least, because we've got a lot of work to do to get people vaccinated to develop this herd immunity. Um, and I think the last component of this that is really important to understand is that vaccination prevents hospitalizations. Um, we know that for a fact, the amount of severe illness associated with patients who have been vaccinated is substantially less. And this is gonna take a huge burden off of our healthcare system if we can get people vaccinated. The only thing I'd add to would like to add to that is just as Dr. Gallus pointed out, to get to herd immunity is going to take a while logistically to get this vaccine to the appropriate amount of people to develop that herd immunity. And so our vigilance and masking and hand washing and all the things that have prevented people from getting sick that have not um, had the virus yet and so on need to be maintained as we go forward until we reach that point. And the other studies that I just wanted to kind of comment about was, was that, you know, when do we develop immunity after the vaccination? So as, as I think most people are aware now, both of these vaccines require two shots. Um, what we think is that people's ma immunity will probably be maximized about a week after their second shot. So even if you, after you've had your first dose, you know, we can't feel confident that you're, you're, you're going to be completely immunized. And so, so I think, you know, when we look at you know where we are at a healthcare system, you know we think our staff are going to be most protected within the next month or six weeks. Uh, now that we've started vaccinating our, our healthcare staff, and 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 I think in the community when that happens, we still got you know we still have another you know six weeks after the first vaccine that we can feel confident that people are better protected, including our nursing home, our our, our you know our LTAC uh, 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 people. I think that's so important to hear. I know I've heard um, several people comment that they're just not going to get vaccinated because they're going to wait for the herd immunity. So um, I have a question from Curtis Wilson. He asked, will the vaccine need to be administered yearly like the flu? And is there a risk that it could mutate faster if people do not receive the second shot? So 
But we're not seeing a lot of information on mutation. You know, the, these, you know, there are, you know, influenza is a great example of a, of, of a virus that seems to change on a, on a yearly basis. You know, the coronavirus family doesn't seem to change, um, and, and we've not seen a lot of information about that. Now, I think the important part of all of this is that, you know, if you get your first shot, you need to be diligent about getting your second shot. I mean, that's the most important thing. But, but the other part of this that we are awaiting, and we will find out, you know, in the next six to nine months, is how long immunity lasts. Because herd immunity is really dependent on two things. It's, it's dependent on what percentage of people have been vaccinated or been infected. And it also depends on how long, um, you know, the, that, that immunity lasts. Because if immunity only lasts for six to nine months, we, we're going to all have to be revaccinated every year. Um, and, and, and I wouldn't be surprised if this becomes an annual vaccine for everyone. Um, and, and, you know, and time will tell. We don't know the answer to that. But what we do know is that in those people who have been infected uh, by, by, uh, by the, the coronavirus, this, uh, COVID, uh, uh, sorry, COVID, we know for a fact that um, their antibody levels at about 90 to 120 days begin to drop pretty dramatically. Now, antibodies aren't the only way we, we protect ourselves. We also have a, a part of our immune system called the T cells, and the T cells do some of this as well. But, but the fact that what we measure, we measure, uh, sh shows that those antibodies really drop off pretty dramatically. And that's kind of a hint that this may be a, an annual vaccine. So we're moving into flu season or we're in flu season, um, but obviously coronavirus has been the spotlight. Um, is it possible to be infected with the flu and the coronavirus at the same time? And we, have we had any of these co-infection cases locally? We have not had any um, co-infections within our health system at this moment. You know, I, and because I do mostly ambulatory medicine, we have definitely seen patients who have presented with uh, with classic, um, you know, flu-like symptoms, tested them for COVID and had their, their COVID test be negative, and then gone back and tested them for influenza and had it be positive. We've had a couple of cases, and I think what Doug said was accurate. We are not seeing as much flu as we typically would expect to see this time of year. And I think the masking component of that is really important. Um, and, and I think Hopefully, hopefully we, we will diminish the burden of influenza on our hospitals and our healthcare system with the masking. And that's really kind of a, uh, uh, an unattended uh, consequence of masking. But, but we saw that in the southern hemisphere of the world where, you know, their flu season has already passed, um, is that it was a much lighter flu season because of masking. So, so I, I, I think that it's important, um, you know, the role of masking preventing other illnesses. But, but I think as a patient who comes in and is seen, you know, we can, we get worried because we are so focused on COVID, we, we overlook other things. And so, so when that person comes in and their COVID test is negative and they've got COVID-like symptoms, you know, do they have strep? Do they have flu? And, and are, are we testing for those? I've seen examples of people coming in with community acquired pneumonias, their COVID test is negative and they're being sent home only to come back much sicker two or three days later. And so we have to be diligent about not focusing on just COVID, remembering all the other illnesses that we deal with on a day in and day out basis. The only thing that I would add to that is um, the winter and the fall time is our big flu RSV season. And with the masking and hand washing helping, we just wanna make sure that we get the message out that it's important that people continue that um, as we stated earlier, the capacity within the healthcare systems is stretched. And if we had a massive flu season, um, that would be devastating for our community. Um, but we do know based on, or based on our results so far that what we're doing to prevent COVID has impacted flu and RSV as well. And, and, and I'll give you my shameless plug, get your flu shot. I mean, we, we talk and talk and talk, um, but, but um, you know, there are still people who are hesitant about getting a flu shot. And I've had many patients who, who have changed their mind this year because of their concerns about COVID. And I think it's so imperative that people get their flu shot this year. So Mark King would like you all to clarify about the different testing types, um, the rapid results versus the two to three day results. Um, should we be confident that someone is negative 
uh, for however many days after that result? And should we be testing every two to three days until the vaccine is available to the majority? Or what do you think is acceptable as far as your diligence in testing and which testing you think is I don't know, more accurate. Those are really, really great questions. And, 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 and I'll, I'll just kind of summarize it in two ways. We, we kind of have the, 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 the first tests that we came up with, which are the PCR tests, which are really looking at specific proteins in our, in, in our, in our, in, in our system. Um, and those are the tests that really detect very low viral levels in your system. So if you think about it as a kind of a bell-shaped curve, when, when a person gets exposed to the virus, within about two days, we start seeing a kind of a logarithmic increase in viral production. And, and that viral production peaks at about five days or so, and then it begins to go down, kind of like a bell-shaped uh, you know, curve. So, so the PCR test, which is the typical one that we, you know, takes a couple of days to get results back, um, that really detects viruses at very low particle at levels. And so, so, you know, you may be able to see a positive test on that PCR before you've even developed symptoms. And then, you know, concurrently, or, or I guess uh, in addition to that, we will see that test be positive maybe three weeks after a person's been infected. So, so it doesn't necessarily reflect infectivity, especially way beyond that 10 day window of time. Um, but, but it's very sensitive at detecting low levels of virus. Now the, now the short acting or, or, or the, the, the quick uh, test, the 15 minute test are, are antigen tests. And those tests really require a much higher level of virus. And so, so we typically reserve those for people who are really sick. We use them in our emergency room, for example, um, when we need to make a determination, and I'm sure all of the hospitals are doing the same thing. Um, if we have someone who's acutely ill, that test can give us a first clue that is this COVID or not. Um, if it's negative, we'll still run the PCR test because it's a much more accurate test. But, but in that setting, when someone's really sick, um, those tests are more accurate. The reason I say all that is because if you have no symptoms and you want to go be with your family, um, you know, that, that quick test, that 50 minute test may not help as much as a PCR test in terms of giving you that window of time. Um, the antigen test will tell you pretty accurately that you're safe for a couple of days. But beyond that, we just don't know because that, as if that was the case, viral counts would start to rise and you develop symptoms. Uh, the PCR test gives you a little longer window. And I'm, I, if I had a preference to be with a family member and I wanted to do a test before I was with them, I'd do a PCR test about two days before I, I two to three days before I was going to be with that family member. So th I would this agree. may be. Oh. Oops, go ahead, please. Well, I was just going to say this may be too early to tell, um, but. Do we have any um, like COVID long haulers, those with long-term health system or health um, symptoms because of being infected? Do we know, you know, what's going to be the effect of that potentially long-term? I'll defer to Dr. Gallus from a, he probably sees it from a clinical perspective on the outpatient. I will say I per personally have witnessed people that um, after being in the hospital for, you know, four to six, sometimes two months on a ventilator for a long period of time, those things, regardless if they had COVID or not, um, play significant, they have a significant impact on your body. And so you do see long-term effects. I, we've seen a lot of people that have had just from a, just a, a fatigue and a general ache or what we would call a um, mental acuteness um, that we've had reported back to us. Yeah, I, you know, I, and we, we read a lot about this kind of long hauler syndrome, you know, what, what people refer to as, you know, kind of long term, you know, um, uh, uh, symptoms after the infection we know is cleared. Um, in my practice, I have not seen that yet. I think that's still kind of an uncommon, um, you know, uh, syndrome, but, but it's out there and I think it's real. And, and you know, we, 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 we've seen over the years, over the decades, you know, this kind of concept of chronic fatigue syndrome, where people are just fatigued, they have muscle aches, they did just, they have disrupted sleep, 
Um, you know, all of these things are, 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 are things that we, we've tried to put our finger on and say, what causes this? We don't have an etiology. We don't know what causes it, but we know it exists. And I think this is one more piece of evidence that suggests that viral in illnesses can cause long-term side effects. You know, we have a lot of people who focus on how many people have died from this illness, but really we need to be talking about death as well as immortality, as well as morbidity. Because when you think about this from the community standpoint, the cost of this infection, uh, the number of people, the number of hours of work missed, the number of, 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 of the amount of suffering that people have had experience with, um, you know, th those are those are tolls that 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 are substantial. Um, you know, I, I've got one of my children had this and was out for ten days with this, um, missed work the entire time. I mean, you know, that put a huge financial burden on he and his his family. So I, I think you know we've got to weigh all of these measures as we think about what our strategies are to uh, to mitigate this going forward. So. Are hospitals and doctor's offices safe right now? I know there are a lot of people that are um, worried about going to just like regular health screenings during this time. So what could you say to those people um, about, about those concerns and then potentially the unintended consequences of um, delaying those routine health screenings? You know, I would say um, I feel the safest when I'm walking the hospital versus when I'm out around because because I know how the disinfection that goes on the everybody's wearing their PPE and um, I would strongly encourage people to seek uh, medical care as they normally would um, with their physicians and their uh, whether it's coming to the emergency room or whatnot but I would definitely say hospitals are safe because everybody's treated and we cohort patients and so there's lots of um, things to mitigate the risk that are in place. And I would tell you it, in my practice, I, I can't count the number of times that I've spent uh, counseling patients about um, the importance of their routine health um, versus a, an infection that they don't have and, and probably wouldn't acquire in our office. And I agree with Doug. I mean, we are so diligent about all of the hygiene related things, the PPE, the cleaning. Um, I think our offices and, and our hospitals are about as safe a place as you can go. The other thing is, is that there's a measure, measurable cost uh, in, in, across our community and across our nation. Um, for people avoiding screening studies. And I think we're gonna see this in the next year or two, the number of people who, who present with advanced cancers, um, you know, things that could have been prevented if we had just prevent, we just provided a routine screening. You know, we look at our screening rates across our system and we've really been challenged. Uh, breast cancer screening has been one of the hardest ones for us to catch up on, you know, after kind of shutting down our clinics for a couple of months uh, in the spring. Um, our, our patients have been much more um, interested in, in, in doing these things now because I think they feel more comfortable, but we had real challenges and, and I think we still continue to have some real challenges. And, and we routinely have conversations with the patients about safety um, and about the importance of mitigating a known issue against something that they don't know, uh, which is the, you know, the infection. Um, so, so, you know, convincing people that, that they're, self in our, they're safe in our practices in our hospitals is really important. So if you all are comfortable sharing this, um, how is the morale of your frontline healthcare workers? I know that you touched on this a little bit, Mr. Williams, with the vaccine now being here and that kind of giving that boost, um, much needed boost to them. But what can we as the business community do to support your, your frontline workers? You know, when I walk through the hospital, um, there's a lot of exhaustion and hope. You know, people are drawn to healthcare to help others. And when crises happen, um, people tend to overextend themselves and really step up. And as Dr. Gallus pointed out, you know, we have been short staffed because the amount of, of uh, people that it requires to take care of this COVID population, which is probably one of our biggest service lines at this moment because of all the, the donning and doffing of PPE that you have to do. And I think the community support that has been demonstrated in Tulsa is a huge morale booster for the frontline healthcare workers in this city. Um, as people continually come in day after day and, and you know, it is a, 
lonely experience for our patients, and they try to extend themselves to them so that they don't feel so isolated. COVID is probably the most isolating thing that I have ever witnessed. And so there's lots of strategies to mitigate that, but it, it tends to fall on the backs of the healthcare providers that, and they get very um, involved with their patients trying to bridge the gap between their family and the patient in the hospital. And so just the continued support that has been demonstrated has been huge when I talk to uh, the physicians and the nurses that are really dedicated to these cohorted areas, um, just when they go out and they now see people masking and washing their hands and just giving them support for what they're doing, that has been the biggest thing. But people are exhausted, they're tired, and they, they, there's a burst of energy with the vaccine, but because of just the logistics and the amount of people that have to be vaccinated, everybody realizes that this is another six to 12 month process. And so it's just keeping keeping that support focused on them so that they can continue to do what we need them to do, taking care of people as they seek health care. Yeah, and, 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 and I would support that. I mean, I, I think that, you know, we, we, we have wonderful support from our, from, from our business uh, partners. I think the most important thing people can do is lead by example. And, and I think masking is one of those things that, that, that absolutely is imperative. Um, you know, business leaders masking and showing that and, and encouraging their employees and, and the people who enter their businesses to mask, I think is really important. As challenging as this is and as controversial as, it, as it's become, it's not controversial in terms of its effectiveness. And I think, I think until we have, you know, the ability to vaccinate, you know, our entire, uh, our entire community, um, you know, the, this leadership is going to be important. And, and like I said, leading by example is the most important thing that our business leaders can do for us, because it'll take us from 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 being stretched so thin um, to to really catching our breath eventually. And, and we'd like to be able to see that, you know, by March or April, you know, the health systems have decompressed a little bit. We're allowing the staff to take some time off uh, and, and, and giving them a breather. And, and we won't get that way unless everyone is following the same guidelines. So I know it may be strange to say positivity in the same sentence as COVID-19, but what are some of the positive things that have happened as a result of the pandemic? Are there any innovations that have happened as a result? You know, I, we talked about the vaccine, which is probably one of the, the greatest quick innovations to, to show the human spirit and what it's focused on something, what it can accomplish. I would say the you know, a lot of the positivity is just the, the collaboration and the focus on the patients that our community has, has seen. Um, it is not a divided healthcare, you know, community with all the healthcare systems in Tulsa working together, talking daily, working with the Tulsa Health Department. And then you see um, innovation that has happened as, you know, we've expanded and every healthcare system in Tulsa has expanded the number of negative pressure um, rooms that they have so that you can have uh, isolation for these patients. And you've seen the, the engineers of all the systems really work with their systems to optimize it for optimal patient care and the safety of the healthcare workers. And then whether it's having drive-through locations for testing or vaccination, or you just see a lot of people collaborating and working together, which is something that I've not witnessed in my 20 years of Tul in Tulsa. And, and it's all for one uh, common purpose of taking care of our citizens. You know, they, they say that necessity is the mother of invention. And, and I think, you know, COVID has really created necessity for us. When I think about, um, you know, uh, paradigm changes in healthcare, video visits is something that, you know, we weren't doing video visits at all before COVID. Now, probably 15 to 20% of our office visits now are done on video. Um, you know, it, because number one, you know, we, we're appropriately reimbursed for that time. But number two, we put the technology in place overnight. Literally, we went from no video visits to, you know, up to 40% of our visits uh, in, in March and April were by video because we had to. Um, and that's a good example of something that will not go away. I mean, you know, our patients love the ability to access their providers, you know, without coming in. And there are a lot of medical conditions that we can treat without having the patient come into the office. So I think those kind of paradigm changes are going to stick with us. And I agree with Doug, you know, the drive through, um, you know, vaccinations and things like this. These are kind of things that we really just toyed with in the past. Now we're, we've, we've kind of built the models to stay. And I think that, that, that um, you know, we'll continue to see more and more change over time. 
You know, another thing, just focusing on the patient, um, one of the things that I've witnessed, I've had family members in other states, and then we've done this here locally in, in our hospital, is the way we're, we've set up communication for our patients. Most people now and today have an iPhone or an iPad, and using um, FaceTime or um, whether it's an Android platform to, make, to allow people to be there with their patient, especially when they're intubated, and just talk to them. And, and that's something that we, at least here, historically have never accomplished. And then as Dr. Gallus pointed out, the amount of video visits across the healthcare continuum, um, I think is something that has been emboldened in this process and that will be a, a concrete part of healthcare going forward, which is a really good thing. So Dr. Jefferson Stewart um, has asked, what about the reports of anaphylaxis from the rollouts in Great Britain? I haven't uh, heard that bit. Yeah, I, th I think that, you know, there's concern about, you know, about reactions, so, you know, and, and we, we talk to patients all the time when we give vaccines, you know, we do this every day. Um, you know, it's very common for people to have uh, minor reactions to a vaccine. That, that's a sign that your immune system has actually responded. But these anaphylactic reactions are a little more um, concerning. Now, the number have been reported has been very small. Um, you know, when we when we look at the total number of people who have been vaccinated and those who have been reported to have anaphylactic reactions, um, you know, the initial reports were there were people who had had previous reactions to other things like medications. But we're now seeing some reports that um, that, uh, that that there are people who have had reactions that um, that had not had previous uh, you know anaphylactic reactions. So. So it's something that we're concerned about. And clearly, you know, as we're instituting process of around vaccination, we're doing a monitoring, you know, for 30 minutes after the vaccine to make sure that people are safe. As we, as we deliver more vaccine, we'll have a better understanding of what the risk factors are and if they're predictable or not. But I think we all have to be prepared that there, there are probably going to be some people who are going to have some pretty adverse reactions. And I think that's a balancing act that's really tough um, when we're trying to convince people to get vaccinated. At the same time, we're seeing these reports. I think my focus is going back to it's rare, it's, it's, it's a low risk, and, and the risk of, of, of us continuing at this setting um, with this degree of infection outweighs that, that need, and we just have to be really careful. So Amy Pulliam sent me a message, and I think that she says this absolutely perfectly. I am in awe of the dedication we have seen from our frontline healthcare workers and the leadership of those like Mr. Williams and Dr. Gallus. I know this has been a tough year for this sector. They have our support, and I hope they can hear us cheering from the sidelines. Thank so with much. that, um, I would just like to say thank you so much to both of you for being with us today. Um, again, I'd like to thank our presenting sponsors, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Oklahoma, Osteopathic Founders Foundation, St. Francis Health System, and Tulsa Bone and Joint Associates. And to everyone who joined us for our final healthcare forum of the year, thank you. We hope you have a very happy holiday and we look forward to seeing you virtually or in person next year. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.